Uh, my aim will be to, uh, I, I haven't changed the due dates on any assignments. Uh, we'll try to fight through this, the fact that we missed a day. But just know that if you're a little bit late, it's not that huge of a deal. All right, so I haven't adjusted that, but uh, don't panic if you need uh, that. So let's pick up where we left off last time. Let's spend a minute reviewing it and then go on to bigger and better things. CSS to it to give it some visual appeal. All right. And CSS, we will cover more and more CSS throughout the semester. I mean, we have just uh, scratched the surface of CSS. I wanted to, uh, I, I like to go over it like at the same time I go over HTML. I don't like to like treat them as separate topics. Because they're each responsible for part of a web page. And then the third component uh, of a typical web page is JavaScript, which we'll get into like the last couple weeks uh, of the semester to sort of complete the picture. Um, but we just scratch the surface right now with CSS. The thing to keep in mind from this point forward is if you are describing what something is, you use HTML. So this is a link, all right? It is a link. So therefore, HTML is what you use to create a link. This is a heading, all right? Therefore, you use HTML to create a heading. This is a paragraph. Therefore, you use HTML to create a paragraph. So if you're putting in the code what something is, you use a tag to do that. The tag defines what something is, what the meaning of it is, what it's, what, it, what it's meant to repre represent on the page. If you're talking about how it looks, it's a CSS issue. So just keep that in mind. And the reason I bring this up is because depending on like when you first were exposed to HTML, there are some things in HTML that you can use to make your page look a certain way. And we're going to avoid them altogether. Anything we want to do with appearance, we'll do with CSS. And when I say anything, I, you know, it's not just colors. The kind of font that you have, the size of the font, the position uh, on the screen of something. Like these things right now are, are simply stacked on top of each other. We can use CSS to position them in a different way. So maybe this is over here and this, and this is over here. All right. Uh, we can put extra spaces between lines. We can put some space between here. We can put borders around things. Really, it's, it's, you know, almost anything that you can describe visually about the page, there's some CSS to handle that. So, uh, when I talk about anything dealing with appearance, it literally means anything with dealing with appearance. Now, remember, the way your page looks is based on a combination of two things. And, first of all, there is the CSS that you write, and secondly, there is the defaults of the browser. So if you write no CSS, like we did through the first couple of classes, if you write no CSS at all, the browser has defaults on how certain tags look. All right? H1s are the biggest heading. Uh, links are typically blue and underlined. Unless they're visited, then they're magenta and underlined. All right? Uh, but your CSS takes precedence over the browser defaults. So if I want the links to look different, I can do that via CSS. To start out, we use colors simply because colors are like the most obvious thing that, that you can do just about. All right? Um, <coughs> but we'll expand to, to cover a, a variety of different things. So let's look at this. Uh, we went over links. I created some links between these two pages. Um, I create a link to another page, Google, National Safety Council, all right, and I 
have a list here that's my navigation. If we look at this, we look at the code for it, we'll start looking at the HTML on this page. We have our main sections, all right? First of all, we have our HTML tag. We have our head, which is information about the page. We then have our body, which is all the stuff that appears on the page proper, on the page itself. The body consists of a header, a nav, at least one article, and a footer. Those are the main HTML5 tags. These were introduced and these replace the div tag that some of you might have used in prior versions of HTML. Now there's a couple other tags in addition to the article that are almost the same as an article. And I'll introduce them and I'll have a few words to say about them. Uh, and then you can, you know, you feel free to use them. There's another tag that's like an article that's called a section. All right. A section is just that. It's a section of a page. Well, an article is a section of a page too, right? So what's the difference between a section and an article? The difference between a section and an article is usually you think of an article as having a lot of words. You know, like being an article in a magazine or, or something. Whereas a section could be a section that has, uh, that, that isn't predominantly words. Maybe a section of photos, for example. Now, that being said, this is one of those things where, like, don't agonize over it, right? In other words, don't sit there staring at the page and say, oh, should I make this an article or... Or should I make it a section? Because it does have some words in it, but there's also some pictures and links and other stuff. It really doesn't matter that much. Make it a section, make it an article. Both of them are available for you. They're different tags, so you can use one for one kind of thing, one for another kind of thing. But it's not like I'm going to look and say, well, you made that a section, and I think it should be an article. I'll never take off for something like that. All right? Um, that's largely a judgment call. Yes? Would you care if we just used all articles or all sections, or it doesn't matter? No, it doesn't matter. You could use all, all articles and all sections. But it is nice that you have the second one in case you wanted to treat it differently. So the big difference would be if you're going to use like CSS for styling. Exactly. The big difference is you could then have a different style set for a section and an article and treat sections a different way. Yes. Can you just give like articles IDs though too? We'll talk about IDs okay. and classes uh, in a in a bit later. Okay. And yeah, you you can use IDs and classes to further differentiate things. All right. Uh, but one of the things to keep in mind, and I was I was talking about this in a, in another class with a student, is that really the idea of these HTML5 tags is that it simplifies your CSS. You will use less classes and IDs with HTML5 than you would under previous versions of HTML because where you used to just have divs before, you had to use classes and IDs. Here, you can make a nav style rule and where in the past you'd make a div with a certain ID and so on. So you, your, your uh, CSS code rather will be streamlined a bit. There's another uh, tag similar to this that's called an aside, A-S-I-D-E. And an aside is like when you have uh, related uh, information to an article. All right? Like you might see in a newspaper or a magazine, there might be an article about the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, might, there might be an article saying what happened or what didn't happen or whatever in the Super Bowl. Then there might be sort of like a related article that maybe focuses on one different aspect of it, like maybe the commercials or the halftime show or whatever. All right. So it's related to the main article, but it's really a separate article. So you can use an aside for that. And again, you're absolutely right. The big reason for doing that is you can style the aside differently. Maybe you put a border around it to make it stand out as a little bit different or whatever. Maybe make the font a little bit smaller because it's not quite as important as a main article. But the aside is the other tag that we haven't talked about yet. All right. Next thing we're going to do is we are going to put our CSS in its own file. All right. 
Someone asked about that last time, and we didn't do it because we were just learning it, and so I just did the most simple way. But if you notice, our two pages no longer look the same because winner has CSS in it, and the about the author page doesn't have CSS in it. So I could go and copy and paste this into the second page. What's the problem with that? What would be the problem if I did this, if I just copied and pasted it into my other page? It's redundant. It's redundant. And what's wrong with it being redundant? If you ever change it, you'd have to change one. Absolutely. If you, if you decided to change it, you'd have to change both of them. So I can make these pages. All right, now they look the same because I put the same CSS in both. But if I come back and say, you know, really, I want the background here to be, let's make the color black. Well, is black on that page? but it's still white on that page. So much you do in software development, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about web development or other kinds of programming, C Sharp, Java, whatever, so much of what you do in coding relates to how easy is it going to be to change this. Because you know that change is inevitable. You know that for whatever reason you're going to have to go in and change it, and therefore you want to make your life easy when it comes to changing it. So almost any time when I say, well, it's a good idea to do this, uh, and you're not sure why I say it, it's probably to make it easier to change. And again, here the CSS code's in two different places. So if I want to change the color for something, I have to go into two different places and change it. Well, imagine on a larger website, you know, even if there were only 20 pages, which would be a relatively small website, if I wanted to change the color, I'd have to go into 20 different pages to change it. That's just too much work. Or you're going to end up with inconsistent, which looks not particularly professional, and you run into different, different problems. So ideally, you want to make your code easy to change. And the easiest way to make a change and to keep things consistent is have code in one place, and one place only. So that's what we're going to do with our CSS. So here's how that works. Let me close some of these other tabs here. I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to put just the CSS code in it. Now, when your CSS code is part of your HTML document, you need the style tag. All right. When the CSS code is in its own file, you don't need a CSS tag. You don't need the style tag. So I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to save this as a CSS file. There we go. And I'll call it style.css. Or I'm, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to call it main.css. All right, so that's called main.css. Now I need a way to link my file, these, this page and this page, to the main CSS. So I will do that by creating a link tag. Now this is different than like this kind of link. All right, it, it's, it's, it's a link, but it's not the same kind of link. This, the link tag I'm going to create here is going to tell the browser, here's where you get the style for this page. And the link is going to look like this. Link rel equals style sheet. And one of these things you don't need anymore, I think the textbook mentions. Uh, but 
I have this memorized, so I don't want to try to learn <laughs> the new rules. Is it what? Isn't the script tag do the same thing like that? Script tag is for JavaScript. Though. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Script tag will be similar to this, but it will be for JavaScript. Okay. All right. So, this, these two things simply tell the browser that we're talking about CSS here. Because we have these things in there, we don't need the style tag in our CSS file. And the href says, well, here's where we're going to get our CSS from. Now, I'm going to save this, and I'm going to save it in the same folder as my HTML documents. For now, we're going to always save everything in the same folder. That will just make our life easier now, and then later on, we'll talk about what if you want to put things in different folders. What if you want to organize your site and have CSS files in one folder, and HTML in another folder, and images in another folder. So, if it's in the same folder, just like with links, you only need the name of the CSS file. So main.css. And I'm going to do that to both of my pages. And again, this works for two pages. It would work for 200 pages, right? They would all have this little snippet of code in here that says, by the way, here's where you find the CSS for this page. So if I did this right, if I bring this up, there it is, and this page, there it is. And the nice thing is, is if I decide to change something, let's say I'm, I want to make the text red on this page, all right, just something dramatic that makes it obvious to see. I only have to change it in one place, and... change takes effect on all the pages. Now let's review. Why isn't this text red? Okay. <laughs> One at a time? Go ahead. Because you didn't style it that way in the CSS? Okay. Let's see what I did do. I said anything article, the text has a color of navy. So, because article is more specific then body, that takes precedence. And what I mean by more specific is this. The body covers everything. Articles are nested inside the body. So the things that are nested inside, those style rules take precedence of the things that are nested on the outside. That's what I mean by more specific. The article is closer to the content than the body tag is. So that CSS rule applies. And that CS rule takes precedence. Okay? Questions about this? And again, we'll review this. We're, we're going over the basics now with color, but again, and you're welcome to try things out on your own. A great resource, especially for people just learning this, is W3 Schools. So don't think that like the only thing that you can do is color. You know, if you want to experiment with stuff, have a blast. So learn CSS, uh, how to put a, how to change the font, for example. I could find an example. Paragraph, font family, times New Roman, times serif. I'm actually not going to do that because the default font is times New Roman. But I could do something like this. I'm going to bring this into my CSS. Again, changing the font is just changing the way that it looks. Right? You're not changing the content at all. You're not changing anything it means. It's still a paragraph. You're just saying the paragraph is going to have this kind of letters. 
All right. We'll talk more about font later on, but this is just to show an example. So I can do that, and if I save that, then this page is going to look different for the paragraphs. And this page is going to look different for the paragraphs. Yes? Uh, can I see the code again? Yeah. On the name? Not that one, the, um, the name page, the winner page. The winner page? Yeah. Because I'm trying to figure out what I've done here. You mean the page, the code, the link, the CSS to the HTML? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, wait, we'll look, we can look at it in lab. Yes? I'm, I was just asking, when I was making my one page, because uh -huh. um, I know we're not doing anything extensive, like with like responsive mm -hmm. and anything, do we, instead of using pixels, should we just use like percentages to help with that? Typically, yeah. Typically, it's a better, uh, we, again, we haven't talked about that yet, right. but typically, it's a better practice to use percentages uh, as opposed to pixels. Because okay. I know I had like a big monitor when I was trying to sell right. it to you. I didn't, it doesn't size very well. Right, so. right, right, exactly. Okay. Now, here's a good question. Um, I don't think this looks too bad. I mean, it's not, well, with the red, it kind of looks bad. All right, let's change that back to white, or, or let's change that back to black, let's say. Well, that doesn't look too bad because Basically, we're using just a couple of colors. We're using a light blue, navy blue, white, and black. White and black sort of don't count to your colors. All right, you know they're they're kind of freebies. How many colors do you think are good on a page? How many colors would do you think would be? Is there is there an upper limit on how many colors that you would use on a page? I'd say there are three or four. Yeah, yeah that probably would be right. There's of course exceptions to everything, right? But as a general rule, if you're doing basic business sort of website, you know, or well, I'll say business, but for like an organization, even if it isn't a business, it could be a nonprofit or whatever, uh, you know, three or four colors are probably enough. Now, here's the thing. We're going to use colors for a couple different reasons. First of all, we're going to use colors to sort of emphasize the mood of the site. We, this is a site about winter, and a lot of times you think of winter, that kind of icy blue color, so we pick blue for that. Uh, so that's one reason for doing it. The other thing that we can do it is colors sort of help organize the page for the user, all right? And they can, they, they can like help separate the page into sections or articles or whatever. So colors are also used for that. They can give the users visual cues. You know, for example, uh, if you were writing a website for a pharmaceutical company and you had warnings, all right, you might use the warnings in red because red traditionally is sort of a color like, oh, pay attention to this, all right, because it's important, all right. So you use colors to make the page look good. I'm not saying that isn't a goal, but you also use the colors to sort of give meaning and help people understand the way that your page is organized. Now, how do you pick colors that go together? Well, this one I kind of played it safe, so it's pretty easy to pick colors that go together. But for more complicated cases, there's actually color wheels. All right? Graphic designers always have used like these little color wheels where you could go and dial them and show complementary colors or whatever. There's like a science to it. So, uh, you know, sometimes I'll get people that will say, like, well, I'm not very artistic, I'm not very creative, I don't know what colors to pick. The nice thing is, is if you have a good eye for that kind of thing, then by all means, it's a good place to exercise it. But if you don't, there's tools that will help you out and help you. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like your animals, right, where you can match your clothes together based on the tags. Well, this gives you a color wheel where you can match things together. So let's look for a CSS color wheel. And there's one that I particularly like, this one. <coughs> and this one, interestingly enough, or ironically enough, is a little hard to see on the screen uh, because of just the way it's projected. But on the monitor, it looks good. 
All right, trust me on this. In this one, you can pick several sort of uh, um, types of color schemes. And then you can pick the color, and it will generate colors that go well together. So, monochromatic means everything's going to be a shade of one color. So, monochromatic one color. Adjacent colors means it's going to use sort of a three color color scheme. A triad is three colors, but with a greater degree of contrast between it. Tetrad is four colors. And freestyle is all bets are off. You just, you know what you're doing, so you're going you're gonna to freshly bake this yourself, right? You're going to make it from scratch. Um, I'm going to stick to monochromatic, you know, just the basic. And I'm going to go and say, well, for this site, I want sort of maybe this kind of blue, all right? Now, what this gives you is this gives you, looks like five different colors. Well, remember in our discussion, we said, you know, hey, two or three colors is probably the most that you want to use anyhow. So this gives you five. So even if you want to make it a little more colorful, uh, this gives you additional colors. <clears throat> and remember, you can use white and black for free. So what you do is you can click on this. And it will show you information about the color. And it will show you the hex code. All right? It will also show you the RGB code. Now, we'll talk about those in a minute here. All right? So I can just copy this. And I can put it in my HTML. Because it's a hex code, it starts out with the pound sign. All right? Then... Let's see, maybe I want the color for my text to be this dark blue. So I'll copy that. And maybe I'll use the same thing for the background of the article. So I use two of the colors. I could possibly pick a third if I wanted. And then it looks like this. All right? Which, again, you know, this isn't like something I'm going to print out and hang on my refrigerator at home, but it's a, you know, fairly good mix of colors in there. So you don't have an excuse to say, look, I don't know how to match colors together, right? Because you can always use tools like this. And again, if you do have a good eye and you're creative and you want to come up with your own, then by all means, go for it. All right, but this is a tool to help people that do have difficulty with it. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to spend maybe five or ten minutes explaining how these codes are created. Right, we mentioned that there are, uh, we mentioned so far two different ways that you can have, you can define colors. You can define colors by name in the case of some of the colors. You can also define them by what's called a hexadecimal code. There's a third way where you can identify them based on how much red, green, and blue there are. So let's, just for fun, I'm going to go to this one, and I'm going to pick the, the RGB code for this, just to show you that that is the same. And when you use that syntax, you say RGB, and then you have three numbers. All right, no change. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about RGB first. All right, RGB is how much red, green, and blue are in that color. Now, those of you that maybe have taken art classes or whatever, uh, or physics classes for that matter, know there's a difference between mixing light and mixing pigments. Okay? So if you're, missing, if you're mixing paint, then that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about mixing light. All right? How many of you remember, like back before the 
these would be projection TVs. Does anyone remember those? Yeah. And they would have three beams of light coming from them. It would be red, green, and blue. And if they weren't lined up right, you'd get like sort of a shadow on the picture or whatever. Uh, HTML color codes are like that because you can create any color, all right, literally millions of colors, <coughs> by just making a combination of red, green, and blue. All right? So imagine we have three lights that are projecting a circle on the screen, and you have red, green, and blue. And you can turn those lights up all the way, or you can turn them off all the way, or you can put them anywhere in between. There's actually 256 clicks that you can click it to. So from zero, which means turned off, to 255. All right, means turned all the way on, and anywhere in between. So if I had red at 255, which is turned up all the way, and I had uh, green at zero, and I had blue at zero, the color is going to be red. Okay, so let's go and do this. Let's make RGB 255, 0, 0. All right. Now, this page isn't going to look good while I do this, but we'll, we'll set it back to normal. So, boom, that's what it looks like. So it's red, and it's a bright red, right? That's like as red, red as you can get. All right, that's as pure red because there is all red as much as you can go, but there is absolutely no yellow, or I'm sorry, absolutely no green and absolutely no blue. Now, if I turn this down a little bit, we're going to get a darker red. So if I turn that down to 128, we get a darker red. I don't know what you'd describe that as, scarlet or whatever. If I turn it almost all the way off, let's make it 16. Then it is such a dark red that it's almost indistinguishable from black. All right. Now, we can also mix colors together. So, 255, 0, 255. What does that mean? It means red's turned up all the way, no green, and blue's turned up all the way. So it's going to be purple. Yeah. And it's going to be a brightish kind of purple. It's going to be a very purpley purple. All right? It's going to be equal parts red and blue. Neither one of them are going to predominate. All right. Now, if I turn down the red a little bit, now should I turn down the red a pretty good amount? It's a bluish purple. If I turn down the blue a little bit, it's going to be a reddish purple. If I turn both of them down, it's going to be like a darker purple. All right. Okay. Now, some of these things are pretty intuitive. Some of these things are less intuitive. For example, what color is all red? Red turned up all the way and green turned up all the way. It's not really necessarily intuitive. It's actually going to be yellow. All right. And again, I can make the yellow closer to orange by turning down the green. Or I can make it closer to a greenish yellow by turning down the red. Alright, now, what do you think this is? Black. That's black, right? Because
because all three lights are turned off. So there's no light, it's black. What do you think this is? It's white. So all the colors are turned up all the way. Uh, what do you suppose this is? Maybe brown? No? Great. It's great. Right? If all the numbers are equal, then it is then it's it's gray. You know, think of it as if you're turning all of them down, you're on that continuum from white to black. So it's gonna be gray. I might also say that you could probably use as many different uh, grades as you want to. Uh, I don't know, I guess you'd have to look to see if that works with your color scheme. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but if I do something like this, what do you think that is going to look like? A warm gray. Pardon me? A warm gray. Reddish gray. A reddish gray, yeah. Uh, another way to say that would be sort of a palish red. It's it's sort of red with a little bit of white thrown in there. So if we look at this, it's sort of a palish red or or a palish pink, if you will. And the closer we make this to all the same, so if I made this, uh, it would be closer to white. All right. Now here's the good news about this. All right. If you didn't understand a word I said, it still works if you cut and paste. It's like I've heard people say, that's the great thing about gravity, right? Gravity works whether you understand it or not. All right. HTML colors work whether you understand them or not. So I don't understand what any of that means, but I can go and copy and paste this color right in here. And it's going to work. All right. In this case, we could look at this and sort of, we might not be able to, in our mind, envision exactly what this is. Right. But we have a pretty good idea. The fact that the third number is highest means it's going to be probably a shade of blue. The fact that the, the even though it's the highest number, it is a low number means it's going to be dark. And it's not going to be purish blue because there's a little bit of, just a teeny bit of red and a little bit of green in here. And sure enough, if we look at this, did I want to do that? I don't know. Oh, I copied the wrong one. I want to do this one. This one again, we can tell the blue number is the highest, but there's a little bit of those others in, so it's going to be sort of a paler shade. And that number is higher than 54, so it's going to be a lighter. And 128 is sort of the cutoff, right, because it's halfway between 0 and 255. And so it's going to be a lighter shade of that color. So where does the other, the hex code, come into? The hex code is hexadecimal, or base 16. We, uh, for, for the standard things that we do, we use a number system that's base 10, right? There's 10 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10 digits. That's called a decimal number system. Hexadecimal is base 16, all right? Why base 16? Because computers are binary, and binary on or off, 0 or 1, and therefore powers of 2, which 16 is 2 to the 4th power, are popular things to do. All right? So in base 16, that is sort of the, this RGB hex code, each of these numbers becomes two hexadecimal digits. So 112 
is converted to 7 0. Right? How do I get that? Well, 7 16, you know, instead of zeros, tens, hundreds, you have zeros, 16s, and 256s. So 7 16, uh, converting that is 112. Right? If you multiply 7 by 16, you get 2, carry the 4, 7, 112. Now, because there's only nine num or ten numbers, zero through nine, the digits A, B, C, D, E, and F are used to represent 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right? So 8F means that we have eight sixteens. That's what? Eight times sixteen is. 128, and then F is what? 15. So 128 plus 15 is 143. I could have cheated and pretended like I was doing the math in my head and read that number there, right? And that would have been the right answer. But I did want to show you that it is possible to calculate it. Yes? Are we going to have to know that for any tests? <laughs> no. Okay. Especially given we don't have any tests in class. So. You can just wipe that out of your mind the past 15, 10 minutes of discussion. All right? Okay. I do want to cover one more thing. And we'll go a little bit long today. Right on your evaluation, this professor gives you more than your money's worth. All right? You're supposed to have a 50-minute class, and he consistently goes 53, 55 minutes. All right? I feel this is making up for the, the day that we lost. All right? I do want to cover a last kind of link, and that is a link to a different section of your page. All right? So, you see this a lot in FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. So if I go to Canvas, Actually, under week two, here's FAQ examples on the web. All right, notice I have a list. This is an ordered list, right, because there's no bullet points, there's numbers. But if I click on this, I go to a section of the page. I don't load up a new page. I'm still on the same page. I just go, the, the, the section I'm going to comes to the top. That's very useful, and then I can go back to the top and answer another question, all right? That's very common for frequently asked questions. It's also very common, like, if a, a company or organization has a phone directory. They might have the list of the letters of the alphabet on the top, and you click, you know, S, and it will jump of the phone directory. Um, that's done with internal links, links to a section of the page. And I made an example. It's under week two. It's called revised FAQ that you can look at. And if you look, I have this little thing, what is HTML, what is CSS, what is JavaScript, and I can click that and have it come to the top. If we look at this, here's how the links are created. Still like a regular link, right? It's an A tag. It has an href. But notice how this is pound signed and a name. It's not HTTP something. It's not something.html. It's not a link to a page. The pound sign ref the pound sign and what go back to the what section of the page thing that has thing that has that as the ID. So this matches this. Notice that in the link there's a pound sign before it. When you define the ID, there's not a pound sign before it. Alright? So take a look at this, and this will give you an idea of how to do 
links. And this is very valuable for, again, some of your assignments. Some of your assignments that you are to have three sections on it, you can put a little navigation to link to that. One last thing I want to talk about is notice I have this nonsense text. This is known as Greek text, and it's often used by designers when they're just sort of mocking something up. So no finished page should ever have this text on it. So please don't turn something in with this on it, you know. But a lot of times if, um, if I want an idea of how a page is going to look like and I don't want to type out everything that's going to appear there, I'll just copy and paste that. You can Google uh, Greek text and you can find a page that generates it for you. There's multiple ones. There's ones like about bacon and everything. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So... Uh, we did cover these fairly quickly, so if you have questions about that, we can bring them up in uh, lab. Yes? Um, I just had one question about something you mentioned earlier. Uh -huh. In my code, I was using the tag for line break on uh -huh. my paragraphs. You said we don't want to use HTML. To be oh. What would be the equivalent for CSS? What would be equivalent for CSS for line break? And that's a good one. That is like really a pet peeve. Uh, early in the semester, I don't complain about it because we didn't talk about it yet. But like later on in the semester, when I see a line break, it's like, <sighs> yeah. uh, what is the equivalent of that is probably a margin. Okay. Yeah, so if you set like a margin, that will put extra space between okay. that. That's what I was thinking. I just wasn't sure yeah. if that was a okay yep. or not. So. Yep. That's one of them that, you know, you know how like in, 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 like, in like court, there's like misdemeanors and felonies. A break tag's like a misdemeanor, you know. It's a whole way of doing it. Yeah, uh, and it's definitely an old way to do it, but it's not horrible. Something like a font tag, that would be a felony. Yes? So if we're doing, like, if we're putting emphasis on a single word in an article, are we allowed to do that in HTML, or do we have to do that in CSS? Okay. It's <laughs> this is one where you could get into a, 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 uh, uh, a debate. It is okay to, you can use an HTML M tag or strong tag, okay. all right? Because that is, that is saying that meaning, that word means something different than the rest of the words in the paragraph. Okay. So it's appropriate to say this word is an important word, so I want to strongly emphasize it. You would use CSS then if you want it different than the default way of showing that it's emphasized. So, for example... It makes it bold, uh, normally. A strong would make it bold. And Equivalent. Strongly emphasize, I want to be red and bigger than normal. 